All right. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm Kieran, and this morning I'm going to discuss the basics of brain computer interfaces, specifically non invasive BCIs, which use EEG. So I believe that there are quite a few specialists in EEG in the audience today. So it's going to be very familiar for you, but for a lot of people, especially from the London group, and as you've seen today, it was, um, it was, uh, mostly focused on neural interfacing with um, myoelectric interfaces. So it's going to be starting from basics so everybody can follow along. So, um, so I'm going to start by talking about brain computer interfaces, what that means exactly, the types of brain sensors that you need to acquire information about the brain in real time, EEG is the focus of this lecture, so we're going to talk about where EEG comes from, um, what we can extract from EEG, and the different barriers that present themselves when trying to extract this information, such as artifacts and, and EEG noise, such, things like that. So then at the end, I'll talk about brain computer interfaces and the typical pipelines that we use. The feature extraction classifications and then move on to the paradigms, the um, the different uh, BCI paradigms that have been created over the last 20 or so years. So a brain computer interface is a hardware and software communication system that allows somebody to interact with a computer by bypassing their peripheral muscles um, or using cerebral activity alone. And that's an important feature. Um, BCIs were motivated by a loss of ability to, um, sorry, it was, they were motivated for use in people with um, neurological conditions. So people who can't use their peripheral muscles. So the, um, the key feature of a BCI is the ability to, to bridge this, to create a new channel of communication with um, computers or external devices. So the, the typical BCI pipeline looks something like this. It's usually a closed loop where you start with um, acquisition of brain signals using a variety of different methods, and then you subject these signals to sophisticated signal processing and classification algorithms, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it usually involves some kind of feature extraction and um, turning these brain signals into um, forms that are discriminative of brain states and then feeding these into translation algorithms, classification schemes, which are then used to control a variety of applications. It could be um, a computer, um, maybe moving a cursor on a screen, left or right, up or down, um, controlling an electric wheelchair or um, sending, a, uh, sending a control signal to a stimulator. This is representing maybe like a functional electrical stimulator. For somebody who's been paralyzed, you may have FES covering the arm, and then by using a BCI, you can um, infer movement attention and then send that to create a functional movement like this one. So EEG is focus of this lecture. So the, the most common um, type of non-invasive um, brain recording is EEG. Electroencephalography, so it, comes from sort of reading the electrical signals from the surface of the head. Uh, you use electrodes to do this, placed directly on the scalp. Um, these can be wet or dry. I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute. Um, but this is generally the, the, ty the type of um, system that you might see where you have these sensors placed on the head, recording this changing signal of, um, from the brain. But it's not the only game in town. There's also this other variety of BCI which may rely on um, uh, hemodynamic changes within the brain. So that's kind of a different side, um, it's, uh, uh, which doesn't then um, record electrical activity. So this type of sensor, functional near infrared spectroscopy, works by measuring blood flow. So different um, parts of the brain, which um, become active, require us, uh, um, tend to um, recruit more uh, more um, more blood, and that can be measured with these uh, these electrodes here. So they work by injecting some kind of uh, light into the into the brain, and then measuring the um, the reflection. Uh, and these work very well. They, they they tend to have a bit of um, 
a delay because when a brain region becomes active, it takes some time for the blood to, to move to that level. But they do have a very good temporal resolution in that they can take a sample very quickly. Um, so just to make you aware of that. And then there are a different category of sen um, sensors, which are the uh, the invasive types. So these involve um, surgery where the electrodes are actually placed on or inside the brain. These have advantages in that they have better spatial resolution um, than EEG, for example. But obviously it comes with greater risk because you need to um, install these inside the brain. And um, they can be expensive and require very um, complex surgery and, and expertise to, to use it. Um, and then recently there's a, um, a new kind of emerging class of, of, of sensor. The, uh, here it's called um, the stentrode, which is um, um, an electrode um, which is uh, implanted in the brain but doesn't require surgery. So the insertion points actually, the, the jugular um, in the neck, and these are inserted through the blood vessels as um, compact filaments and then they're expanded in this stent formation and uh, these can allow very close measurements from the brain so from inside that don't require this very um, dangerous surgery. And these are, this is actually bi-directional as well, so it can read signals, electrical signals from the brain, but it can also stimulate as well. So this is um, relatively new in the last couple of years, but um, it's undergoing clinical trials in America at the moment, and it's, uh, it seems quite promising. But, um, oh, and then we go on to the, the room size sensors. So this is another category where MEG, for example, measures the, uh, the magnetic part of um, the, the brain compared to the electrical part. And um, this has advantages over EEG in that it tends not to be affected by volume conduction, things like this, but has very bulky equipment. And then fMRI, which has advantages in that it provides ex excellent spatial resolution. Um, but again, has, um, is a huge um, um, sensor. So the, the, these devices are not really realistic in BCI, yeah, BCI practice. Um, so all of these different sensors have their own unique characteristics and are all valuable in certain contexts. So here you can see all of the different um, sensors I mentioned plotted with the time and the spatial resolution. So um, EEG kind of sits in a sort of sweet spot in terms of its, its spatial temporal resolution and its uh, mobility and um, the, the cost of such a device. So that's what's going to be the focus of this lecture. And indeed, a lot of the research in non-invasive BCIs have used EEG. So why has EEG been so used yet? So we have the high temporal resolution factor. Um, so EEG can record up to kilohertz, for example. That's one sample every millisecond, or it can go even higher. So the, the, the resolution of cortical um, processes tend to be within tens of milliseconds or 100 milliseconds or maybe a few seconds. So EEG can constantly um, acquire data very fast and can track these, um, these changes in, in brain activity very easily. They're relatively low cost, especially compared to the multi-million pound fMRI scanner that you saw there. They're portable um, in that uh, you can pack them into a case or even carry them around with you, depending on what kind of equipment you have. Um, they pose little risk to the user, uh, except in the very rare cases that you might be um, allergic to the electrode material or something, but this is very rare. So in general, they're, they're, they're non-invasive, they're, they're very safe. They do have their limitations, of course. EEG has a very poor signal-to-noise ratio. What you're trying to detect with EEG is extremely small in terms of the signal and the noise, which it also records, is extremely large. So um, being able to analyze EEG data requires a lot of um, skill and interpretation. And then there's the poor spatial resolution as well. So you're recording activity from the brain at a, at a distance. So these generators of electrical activity are a few centimeters away. So you have this um, spatial smearing and there's a sort of theoretical um, um, it's a theoretical resolution that you can really expect to achieve with EEG and it's within about one to two centimeters. So if you're trying to explore the difference between 
cortical regions that are very close, EEG is going to prove very difficult in, in doing that. So you need to keep the, these considerations in mind. And then EEG is also, it's a measure of electrical activity and there is lots of electrical activity out there, especially from in the, in the body, which excludes the brain. So you have lots of, you, you pick up lots of um, artifacts from the EEG. That could be from the heart, from the muscles, from the eyes, et cetera. And then you have um, exogenous electrical interference. So that's from, um, from, from outside the body as well. And um, EEG can't detect everything that's happening in the brain, especially things that are happening deep in the brain. There's this um, inverse square law. So the further you get away from a cortical generator, the weaker it is. And then much of what's happening in the brain is just invisible to EEG. And then you have this other um, example of uh, even things that are on the surface. If you have um, folds within the brain, um, activity within the brain that are causing tangential currents or dipoles that are sort of um, facing each other, they'll cancel each other out and be completely invisible to EEG. So there's some things that you can detect with EEG and a lot that you can't. So practically speaking, recording EEG is done with electrodes. Um, most of the systems or the most of the, the, the lab-based systems that we use are, are gel-based, so it uses a conductive medium to bridge that gap between the, the head and the, and the electrode itself. There are different types of electrodes, so the, the, the most common is the, the passive electrode, which is just a ring of usually um, gold or sort of a silver chlorine um, composite material. More sophisticated electrodes might be active, so these have a pre-built, a built-in amplifier which amplifies the signal at the level of the, the scalp, which tends to create a higher fidelity signal. And then recently there's been a move towards dry electrodes, which you can see here, these little spiky things. And these are these have been designed to overcome this um, the, the use of gel because it has some limitations and it they could quite messy. It's a bit um it's a bit annoying to to have to to, to set up um, with them because it has to be washed out afterwards. Um the gel base or the, the dry electrodes penetrate the hair and they're not as uncomfortable as they look because they're very blunt and the pressure is kind of distributed with lots of different needles there. And they have a hybrid electrode here, which um, GTEC have released recently, which can be used both with gel or with or dry, but just to make you aware of the different types. And then, then we have um, the signal itself is acquired um, in its analog form. It's amplified either at the electrode or at a external amplifier or both. The signal is then low pass filtered and um, is sampled at a fixed rate. And for EEG applications, you usually use between 256 hertz or 1000 hertz, usually not more than that, because a lot of the features that we, we look for in EEG are quite low frequency, especially compared to high density EMG applications. So what we're looking is is usually found within 1 to 10 hertz. So 256 hertz is usually um, sufficient. So EEG looks like this then, so we've probably all seen this kind of brainwave classic um, example of EEG. What we're seeing here is about 30 or so EEG channels recorded over about a um, few seconds from different places on the head. So each line here represents a different spatial point on the scalp. What you can notice is there is a lot of um, correlation across these channels. Um, for example, here you get this um, you get this correlation um, locally. So this may be implying that some sort of local brain activity, and then you get more uh, global correlation between the channels as well. Maybe um, suggesting some sort of global brain activity. Um, but then on top of superimposed on top of what we're seeing here is is meaningless um, information as well. Noise, for example. Um, so you know one of the the, the goals of the neural engineer is to be able to separate the brain activity here from the noise in order to perform the um, brain computer interfacing. So what we saw there is a reflection of the electrical medium within the brain. Um, so what exactly, how exactly does that manifest into the, the, the brain waves that we saw there? So the EEG um, reflects neural firing processes of the pyramidal neurons in the, the gray matter of the, the first five layers of the brain. So these uh, pyramidal neurons have these long dendrites which 
importantly run perpendicular to the, the surface of the of the cortex. Um, when these cells are active, they create this electric electric current, which I should point out is completely invisible to EEG, as it's so weak that the distance makes it um, um, essentially impossible to resolve from the noise when you're using an electrode so far away. So the only way you'll be able to detect the activity of a single neuron like this is with extremely sensitive electrodes placed directly into the brain right beside the, the neuron. So what does EEG actually measure then? It measures the, the summation of thousands of, of neurons firing simultaneously. So it's kind of, there's this, uh, the, the classic example is if you're standing outside of a football stadium, um, you can't hear what an individual is saying, but when everybody is singing or chanting in unison, suddenly then the signal becomes amplified and you can hear you can hear what, what's been said. And that's the same for EEG. So only when the neurons are firing simultaneously can the, me can the signal be being, um, recorded from the outside. Of the brain. And this is a phenomenon of, of pyramidal neurons. They do tend to fire, fire simultaneously in synchrony um, as they perform different cortical processes. So as I say here, the rhythm that we acquire from outside of the brain is um, proportional to the number of the, 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 the firing neurons. So the more neurons that are firing together, the stronger the signal that we record outside. So EEG is usually um, um, a reflection of this large scale synchrony. So why would these neurons fire at the same time? Um, so there are two main reasons. Um, one is that there are there's a, a an external event that creates this this um this synchrony and that could be if you're presented with something and there is this sudden um, sudden cascade of neural processes for example if you're trying to if you're suddenly presented with a stimulus a flashing light or something like that and um, the visual cortex um, may all begin to act um, in, a, in a similar way and and create this this phenomenon of neuron synchronization and a lot another type of um, type of synchronization comes from the steady state firing pattern so you have different um, areas of the brain which are performing specific tasks and um, when they're performing specific tasks they become less synchronized as they go about their um, individual um, individual tasks but um, when they become when they no longer have anything to do they have they go into an idling state and they, they, they tend to form follow this similar this similar firing pattern. So the, the, an example would be that the visual cortex located at the back of the head processes um, what we're seeing. We close our eyes, we see a strong increase in the amplitude um, at, of um, the brain waves at this region. As the uh, the different um, as we're, we don't have anything to process, so the the, the the neurons tend to go into this idling state of oscillating at the same the same rate. So these two phenomenons motivate the two major types of BCI. Um, BCIs which are controlled using event-related potentials um, or by oscillations. So I'll talk a bit about the oscillations. Um, these are derived from the, the waveforms that we saw earlier. You can apply um, pro, um, signal processing to isolate the constituent waveforms um, into these different uh, frequencies. So you have the delta wave, um, which is lies between zero and four hertz. This is a slow oscillating wave, which becomes extremely prominent during a deep sleep. So it's able to quantify the, 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 sort of the, the, the level of, um, of sleep um, that you're, you're in. And by the way, I, if, if nobody's familiar with what hertz is, uh, one hertz is just one cycle per second. And then going on to the theta band, so we have four to eight hertz. Um, this has been connected to um, light sleep and stress, alpha band um, awakeness and relaxation. So the mo this wave is modulated by these phenomena. And then beta, we have a concentration and movement. This wave tends to be uh, attenuated um, during movement. And then the higher frequencies, the gamma band, have been linked to perception and consciousness. 
or um, memory retrieval and, and, and things like this. So each of these bands have over 100 years of study of electrophysiology has been linked to different cognitive processes. Some are relevant for DCIs and some are not. One that is particularly prominent in DCI literature is that the that alpha band between 8 and 12 hertz. This band um, is been linked to so many different things. Two, I'm going to talk about two of them. So um, depending on where you record it from the brain, it tends to have two functionally distinct functional distinctions. If it's recorded from the occipital cortex in the back of the head, it's been linked to um, to wakefulness. It's, it's attenuated when the eyes are open, or it's um, it's particularly prominent when the eyes are closed. So this wave you can see has this sort of sinusoidal shape. Um, at about 10 hertz and it's um, particularly small, it's 10 microvolts. So the other form of wave that comes from this spectrum is the mu wave, which is recorded most prominently from the sensory motor cortex, top of the head. And it follows a similar um, frequency that has a different shape. It's non sonicidal and the, the tops are sort of flattened a little bit and have this mu, mu somewhat this mu shape. And um, there's the, the way that you see here would probably be seen in the majority of you now, as it's um, it's quite well defined, particularly well defined when you're seated and relaxed. But the begin the moment that you begin to move or even imagine moving, this wave becomes um, compressed, and um, it's a it's a correlate of um, of movement planning and execution. Uh, so. So you can see how the um, the changing the changes of these waves can be related to BCI and how they can be they can be um, used uh, for control signals. So not only is EEG very well spectrally defined, it's also spatially defined. We have this classic example of the motor homunculus. Um, the different areas of the body are mapped onto different different regions of the cortex, with um, the the largest areas being shown here um, the most complexity at the, at the brain so not only is EEG defined very well spectrally it also has this well spatial it's well defined spatially as well so it's important to know these things in order to be able to perform BCI experiments so you know what you're looking for um, so with that in mind uh, EEG has been um, it's important to know where you where you're recording with um, EEG. So this system has been devised to make sure that there's consistency across experiments across labs. Um, it's a, it's more or less universally accepted that this is now the the standard. So this um, 1020 system um, defines where electrodes should be positioned during exper an experiment. You have this uh, this kind of uh, line between the, the nasian or the the top of the the, the nose to the kind of Indian at the bony protuberance at the back of the head, and then this uh, invisible line defines where we should position our electrodes with CZ at the top of the head, and then there's a, another line from left to right between the between the just the point um, in front of the ear. So from this you can then um, infer where where the electrodes go, and then you have the the C electrodes, the sort of central electrodes, the F, the frontal, P, parietal, O, occipital. So it defines these different electrode locations based on the, the cortex or the brain area that they sit above. And then there are extensions of this uh, montage. So you have the 64 electrode montage and the um, 128. So for, for, for increasing your, for, for high resolution recordings. And then, like I say, EEG is very noisy. So the human body is almost like an antenna picks up all of these electrical interference which manifests in EEG. So one of the ways um, that EEG tends to combat this is using um, a reference, a referencing system. So the most common one is the monopolar electrode, which essentially um, means that all of the EEG electrodes um, are recorded relative to a reference electrode, which is usually placed on the head um, in an area that's um, it's receiving this common noise, but um, is is non is not near, um, is not active in terms of brain activity. So usually that's maybe the earlobe or 
the, the mastoid behind the ear. And then this is recorded in parallel with EEG and subtracted from the signal. So what you're left with is something which um, um, has a better signal to noise ratio than if you recorded it without an electrode, without a, um, a reference. But there's also um, the bipolar system, which records EEG to get um, two EEG channels together and measures the difference. And then this can be used to eliminate this um, this common noise, but also to uh, to enhance the, the the signal to noise ratio. There's um, the reference free um, method, which uses a common average reference. So this method adds um, subtracts the mean value of all the electrodes together. Uh, this method has its advantage in that it doesn't rely on a single channel as a reference. So say this channel becomes um, bad during the experiment, then you're not um, you, you're not you, you don't bring that 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 noise to um, to the rest of the recordings. The common average reference can be done offline as well. And then there's the Laplacian filter, which is a spatial filter. So this can be used to enhance uh, local brain activity and try to attenuate the, um, the more diffuse activity. So this works by subtracting the weighted sum of neighboring electrodes. We have two different types, the, the large Laplacian and the small Laplacian. The small Laplacian uses the nearest neighbors um, and the large Laplacian uses the next nearest neighbors. So the, this is this is a way to um, try to enhance the signal to noise ratio on the surface of the head. And then on top of that, we have the artifacts that are inherent in EEG. So like I said earlier, we have these um, endogenous artifacts and exogenous artifacts. So the, the ones that come from inside the body are most prominently things like eye blinks. Um, uh, these affect particularly the frontal electrodes. We also have EMG, which is this high frequency um, signal that can come from anywhere in the body, be um, usually following movements. Then there's um, things like e ECG, which can be measured from EEG, pulse waves, and then there's the non-physiological artifacts, so power line noise, and then low frequency drift, which is based on the, um, the, the electrode to, to skin contact and DC power. So an example of the muscle artifacts is here. So you can see it pretty com pretty prominently. To begin with, we can see these nice oscillations here. And then as soon as um, some EMG is introduced, the entire signal becomes corrupted fully. And this um, this can cause the, the signal to become completely invisible, or at least the signal that we're looking at. Um, eye blinks um, are characterized as these kind of low frequency, large amplitude amplitude peaks and can take half a second or longer to rebound back to baseline. They affect maybe maybe the, the frontal electrodes, but in theory they can affect all of the electrodes. Um, they just may be more subtle in the electrodes posterior, the posterior region. So reducing artifacts is really important for high quality organs. One of the most simple things you can do is just ask participants to, to sit still as possible, to reduce their blinks when you're recording that kind of thing. This is not ideal, it can be, un be uncomfortable. But there are other methods like filtering, for example, you can filter um, out the, the, uh, the low frequencies and the high frequencies, because um, we're mostly interested in what's happening in between one and 50 hertz anyway. So EMT typically presents as a high frequency artifact, so you can just apply it. A low pass filter. And then the power line noise, depending on where you are in the world, if you're in the UK, um, you have this 50 hertz component and um, or 60 hertz in America. So the notch filter can be used to remove that very high frequency and noise. And then removing noisy channels is obviously important. That can be done offline as well. And then using things like ICA can also be used to extract these um, these components. Um, after they've been recorded, but online this can be a bit more difficult. So to go on to BCI paradigms, one of the most simple types of ECI that you can probably do is the type of neural feedback. So this is when you record a signal from the brain and just feed it back to the participant in the terms of visual uh, visual representation here. So this is just an alpha wave neural feedback paradigm, which can be used can be used when it's fed back to try to modulate that. So here you can see the, the green bar is 
is a reflection of alpha band power and the participant is asked to to modulate it either up or down and this can be done for purposes of um, trying to um, try to bit try to better relax because the alpha band has been linked to different um, to different things like relaxation in fact in this this example here um, they're using the alpha wave modulation for pain management because it's been used it's been linked to uh, to chronic pain particularly following spinal cord injury so this is a very simple BCI and it would follow a, a pipeline such as this so you can do it with even a single electrode where you bandpass filter to um, isolate the the frequency that you're interested in you perform squaring of the time series data you take the take the average and uh, apply a square root or, so what you essentially have is this moving variance of bandpass filter signal and that's fed back to the participant which they can then use to up modulate or down modulate this modulation is done through different strategies so it's um it's, 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 a, it's a learning process to be able to do this because it's not intuitive how one increases or decreases the alpha band power. So um, this may take training in order to do this. And if anybody have participated in these experiments, I'm sure you know it's quite difficult. And then this, these kind of systems have even been made um, commercially available because it's very, very simple. Um, but more interestingly um, are the, uh, the brain are the BCIs that rely on machine learning to predict brain states. So these are what I'm going to focus on now. So these types of uh, BCIs rely on common framework, which usually has um, a training phase and a prediction phase. The training phase is really important because you need to um, present this, the BCI with information that's never seen before. It needs to learn um, and le learn how to classify between br different brain states. And you can only do that by using um, training data acquired from um, this the participant who is going to use that BCI. So it looks like something like, like this. You have your EEG and you're going to ask the participant to perform different tasks which are relevant to the BCI. Um, this could be left hand motor imagery or right hand motor imagery. Um, you're not going to give any feedback to the participant. They're just going to try to perform this in order to provide the, 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 the BCI with data. And then you take two things from this phase. You take the data itself and you take the labels. So you then use this to train a model. And then this model can be used to classify unseen data. And then that model then gives it a label. And then that is used for control. So using machine learning with BCI has sort of key features um, compared to other machine learning applications. EEG, as I said, has very low signal to noise ratio and has high dimensionality. So you could take one example of EEG um, or, um, of left hand motor imagery with 64 channels of electrodes. So that's 64 features that you have. And if you're Considering one second, that could be 256 samples from 64 channels. So that's un like tens of thousands of, of features for one brain state, which is um, a lot for a model to, to, to deal with. So I'll talk about ways to overcome that cursive dimensionality in a minute. And then BCI has um, an incredible amount of variability when it comes to, to EEG. EEG is a non stationary signal. So over time, EEG changes. Um, the EEG that you record at the beginning of an experiment can be completely different to what you record at the end of an experiment. So if you're training a BCI on data um, from the first 10 minutes of your experiment, it can become completely altered by the end of your experiment and you lose the ability to discriminate between different brain states. And this includes um, between sessions as well. So from day one to day two, um, the EEG can change and then between participants as well. So what I'm saying is um, you can't train machine learning models on data across sessions or between participants. It would be great if you can. We would have a whole um, array of, of data that we could use to make really robust models. But the fact is that um, EEG is constantly changing. And then that leads on to the other point about small data sets. So, um, you have to spend lots of time to acquire this training data in order to calibrate these models. So it's inherent 
in VCI with EEG that you you have these small data sets and you have to you have to factor factor this in for creating um, these pipelines. Classification needs to happen as quickly as well. So if you're expecting a response from your BCI, if you're using neural feedback, for example, to modulate something, you need to have constant, constant, um, um, constant output. So you can't use a model that requires more than a few seconds to make a decision or to make a prediction of what brain state. Yeah. So to reiterate, um, brain machine um, classification is based on trials, so we need to perform many, many instances of the same. Um, task in order to get lots of data and then we can use this to create um, supervised learning models. So given a training data, um, find a model that maps the input, the unseen EEG to an output to, to a label or um, class. So like I said before, um, even if you have one second of 64 channel EEG, you have 10,000 degrees of freedom. So all of these data points need to be mapped into a space that can be used to classify future EEG, which is just too many because you've got just too few examples. You can only expect to obtain between 50 to 60 examples of, um, of, a, of a brain state. That might be left-hand motor imagery or right-hand motor imagery. So you need to employ a strategy to um, create a more compact form of EEG that maintains the, um, the, the information so there are different strategies for that. Feature extraction is what we call it. We can take these time domain, these brain waves, and condense them into a more compact form using very simple metrics like mean, median, variance, zero crossing, things like that. Or we can convert them into the average band power over a second or so. So this is a way to convert from, say, um, 256 hertz. Um, 256 samples a second to to one sample, and that one sample should be representative of um, what, what what's happening at that particular point. And this works fairly well to reduce the, the quality of the signal. There's also um, other features that we may consider, like fractal dimension, which is the measure of the complexity of the signal. This can reduce the signal to a single point as well. And then coherence, which might be um, coherence between different um, different electrodes across the room. And these can be used as features to train classifiers as well. So the most commonly used and simple classifier is this linear classifier, the linear discriminant analysis. So this works by trying to find a hyperplane to separate distributions, which are usually two, two class distributions. Um, left hand motor imagery on the, on the left and then right hand on the right. You try to find this plane so that when new information comes in, it will it will lie somewhere on this line. And then um, that will that will um, classify the trial. So using this um, this formula here, we have the, the this uh, simple prediction function where it outputs a sign either positive or negative depending on what class um, the new data lands on relative to the to the line. So just to give a concrete example of what all, what this all means. So imagine that a person sitting in front of a computer screen. They're queued to perform 50, um, 50 times to so imagine their left hand moving or the right hand moving, and they have electrodes placed all over their sensory motor cortex. So how do you design a BCI that you can determine whether a person is imagining left hand movement or right hand movement? So you can take this training data and um, each trial you cut out a segment of the EEG after the queue to imagine movement. You extract band power features, as we just demonstrated earlier, we know that the alpha rhythm is modulated using motor imagery. We can then, then assign the, each segment of data to a label. Was it a left-hand motor imagery or was it right-handed motor imagery? We can then design spatial filter and use this limit, linear discriminant analysis to design a model in which to label new unseen data, provide it with a class label. So. The first thing to do um, we can do is consider neuroscience and electrophysiology. So what is actually happening during left and right hand motor imagery? So um, during movement, um, we have this uh, event related desynchronization above the area which instantiates the uh, the movement. So we know that the, co the motor homunculus is distributed across the, the, the hemispheres of the brain. 
left hand motor imagery or left hand movement is generated on the, on the uh, right side of the brain and then vice versa for the, for the right hand. So we have this very well defined spatial distribution during movement. And uh, you can see here that um, uh, right hand, um, which is measured from the right side of uh, from the left side of the brain, has the stronger desynchronization than during the left side. So this is from C3 on the left side of the brain. This is from C4 on the right side of the brain, and it's almost this mirror opposite, um, this mirror opposite reflection of uh, of, of, of power. So it's important to realise that. We have this distribution and we can actually use this to create spatial filters that can maximize or um, leverage this predictable pattern um, between these two classes of motor imagery and we can create a spatial filter that can that can um, enhance this effect so that the common spatial pattern uh, algorithm has been designed to do exactly this to find spatial filters which maximize the variance or which is a correlate band power between one class and, and minimize it for the other and vice versa. So we want to find a um, series of weights to place on each electrode in order to, to maximize the variance of one class and minimize the other. So you can see here, this is before you, you apply a spatial filter. What we, can, what we have here is essentially um, the distribution from two electrodes, C3 on the x-axis, let's say, and C4 on the y-axis. And we have these two classes, red, maybe left hand and right, um, uh, right hand motor imagery. And, and these are not trials. This is just one trial and it's the time series. So you can see here that we have um, a, a, a difference. Um, there is a difference in these clusters. They, they look slightly distinctive, although it's not that, um, it's not that e easy to um, differentiate between them. But we do have um, greater variance in one class compared to the other. We look from the perspective of this electrode here. The blue is, is is widely spread across this axis compared to the red, but it's not maximal. So the aim of the CSP algorithm is to design filters that can um, maximize this separability, this discrimination in order to aid classification. So we want to find spatial filters W that can be applied to to the, the two different classes, class one and class two, and that's exactly what. Um, we can see here. So there's this linear um, filtering or linear transformation that's happened here where there's sort of this squashing um, of the two distributions. And what we're left with is if we look just from the perspective of this axis, we have um, very low variance in the blue and then high variance in the right and then vice versa. So that's a, that's an ideal case there. Where we have these uh, two, two, um, two classes that have been maximized and then this can, can allow for better discrimination. So um, we can then feed that into the, the prediction function that I talked about earlier. So we have um, we have our new EEGX multiplied by our spatial filters when then we extract the, the, the variance which is a correlate of band power and then that can be used to then calculate the the new the new class. So to put all this together um, we have our training data, which, which we acquired offline, offline, no feedback was given. Um, um, we have our different trials, we band pass filter between eight and 12 hertz, we calculate these CSP filters, we apply it to the data, uh, we extract the band power and we use that to train our LDA classifier. We then take that online and subject it to unseen, unseen EEG. We do the same thing again, um, Bandpass filter. Now we apply these trained filters, which has created a more um, the distinctive, or increased the variance between the two classes or minimized it depending. Um, we extract the, the band power and then we, we, we subject it to the trained models, and this gives us our predicted class. So the advantage of motor imagery BCIs is that it's endogenous, so it's, so it's, um, it's, it's the brain signals that we want to classify are. Are instantiated from our own free will, so to speak, instead of being um, from an external stimuli. Um, so you can you can you can um, interact with this BCI through imagining. So you can it's um, something that you can do yourself. And then the disadvantages are yes, there's a long training time. So in order to generate a robust classifier, you need to give it a lot of 
high quality information. Not all users can control motor imagery BCI. It really depends on the, your own your brain, and every brain is different, has different physiology, so or different in um, shape. Sorry. So some people can, most people can control this type of BCI, but some people can't. And you need um, quite a lot of channels to be able to have a high, highly accurate system based on this format. And the bit rate is fairly low. So um, you can really only make decisions based on two different classes at a time. There are extensions to multi-classes, but the, the accuracy tends to drop off a little bit. So to have a look at a different type of control signal for BCI is the steady state visual evoked potential. So this is a completely different form of control signal. Instead of it being an endogenous signal, it's, um, it's, it's generated from um, stimuli from the um, external stimuli. So the SSVEP is generated by um, gazing at flickering stimuli, which you can, can't see here. By gazing at a flickering stimuli, you can detect this from the occipital region at the back of the head. You can convert the time series EEG into its frequency spectrum, and you can actually observe um, a peak at the exact same frequency that you are, you're looking at. So if you're looking at a seven hertz um, flickering stimuli, you can see this in the EEG here and its harmonics, so it's 7, 14, and 21. So you can imagine that just by changing your gaze towards different stimuli, um, flickering stimuli, you can then use that to control um, that could be like a left, a right, up or down. And it's uh, purely based on cortical um, cortical rhythms. So to show you that again. And then we'll talk about this in more detail th this afternoon. So a, a fun example is somebody used, combined a, an, an SS BEP BCI with drone control. So trying to use this drone purely based on cortical activity. Um, so we have our drone here, which goes into this steady state where it just sort of hovers in the air waiting for a command. And then we have our user here, uh, our pilot, uh, different flickering up, down, left, right. Eyes are closed at the moment, so he's waiting to be given the cue to, to begin his command. And then in a moment, um, he'll be asked to move the drone forward. He looks at the flickering stimuli, the BCI detects that he's looking at the stimuli and then sends a control signal to the drone. So, I think he's given the command now. Should be so. Okay, so I think now he's called. To look at the go go forward stimuli, and then and then there it is. So that's just one way of um, combining this kind of BCI paradigm with um, with an application. So the other type of evoked potential that you can detect from EEG is P three hundred, which is a very repeatable um, form of BCI. So this type of signal is. Um, is an evoked potential. It's not an oscillatory or modulation of an oscillation like the, the motor imagery BCI. Um, it's, it, it's characterized as a high amplitude peak measured about 300 seconds after a stimulus. And that stimulus is, is an oddball stimulus. So it's, um, it, it occurs after the presentation of um, something unexpected, for example. For example, if, you, if you're presented with 20 pictures of a flower and then the twenty-first picture is a as a face. It will generate this kind of this kind of P three hundred three hundred milliseconds after, it. and this can be used to to create a, a different kind of brain computer interface. So here you can see um, a short um, one second window of EEG when you are when you're exposed to the high frequency stimulus like the flower, you get this um, red trace here. So it's roughly around zero. But when you're then exposed to the low frequency stimulus, the one that you're not expecting, you get this P300. So um, this, this is what I'll talk about now. 
and it's uh, it's it's thought that this this potential here is linked to the the, the processing that's involved in classifying the stimulus in your in your brain. So it's been this kind of speller has been devised and built around the P three hundred phenomenon. So you have these this um, crossboard of, uh, of letters. If you then gaze at the sub at the character that you want to select, um, the flashing will hit that character seldom, uh, very few um, few times, but occasionally it will hit that character, and then you get this P three hundred. The BCI is then keeping a track of this, keeping a score, and then by comparing the the left sweeps and the right sweeps, you can then infer which letter you were looking at. And this works very well, as you can see here, at 95% classification accuracy, although three to four characters per minute is probably quite slow if you compare it to other forms of communication. So the advantages to the evoked potential BCIs are that there is minimal training required compared to the, the motor imagery where you need lots of uh, examples to generate these models, these classification schemes. Uh, you don't need as many electrodes. For example, the P300 can be used just using one or more electrodes over the, over the cryotal cortex. And then it allows this greater exchange of, of information. The problem is that you have to constantly attend to this external stimuli, especially in the case of the SSVEP, you have this constant flicker that you're that you're that you're looking at can be quite annoying for the user so it has its advantages and disadvantages and then another type of BCI that I wanted to show you um just a, a, as a point of interest is uh, th this new type of format called the brain to brain interface so in this case you're you're exchanging information from one brain to another from one person to another so here you have um, the intention to move is inferred from one person's motor cortex using EEG. It's then sent across the internet to a completely different person who's sitting underneath a TMS coil. A TMS coil registers this intention to move from somebody else and causes an, a, a, causes a contraction in the person's in the person's hand. So it's it's a way of controlling somebody else um, through your own brain activity. I, I'll, hopefully, you can see see this. So this was um, a few years ago. So you have your, your sender here wearing his EEG. He's just performing motor imagery. You have your receiver under the TMS coil. And um, he's playing another game, which he can't even see this screen. And then when the BCI receives the control signal, he gets shocked with the TMS. Processes. So I present this as just um, as, a, as a point of interest. I think it's very interesting, especially to see it. It's in a very infant stage here, but to think about the kind of ethical questions that this kind of paradigm raises is, is interesting and very relevant for BCI in general. So, so why are we using a BCI? Um, uh, for communication, as I said before, it's been motivated by um, rehabilitation and people who have had neurological uh, injuries that allow them that, that sort of um, mean that they can't communicate. So P300 was a good example of this. Uh, there's also this other side to um, clinical applications using rehabilitation. So where somebody's had a stroke, they can no longer control one side of a body or they're, they're weakened. You can combine a BCI with rich afferent feedback, for example, using an FES stimulator. Um, so uh, um, so the, the, the intention to move is combined with some kind of sensory feedback. So you're closing this, this loop and this reinforces a, a brain, brain plastic mechanism. And uh, there, there's also applications involving healthy people as well. Um, for example, athletes have been using motor imagery for many years to try and improve their, their strength and position. For example, tennis players or, or golfers can improve their swing, for example, by constantly imagining the movement inside their own head without actually performing it. You can use a BCI to quanti quantitatively assess how well players are, um, are perfor performing this motor imagery. And then there's also things called effective BCIs, so tracking the mood of, of people human, um, through human augmentation. So you can track the alertness of, um, of drivers, for example. This might be relevant moving forward in the age of um, self-driving cars, for example. So uh, how are we on time? 
I can't remember when we started. Um, so, so just to touch briefly on some recent progress for BCI research, um, people have been looking into ways to um, to get around this problem of having low, extremely small data sets because it is a huge problem. So there's this way of creating artificial data through machine learning or, or other means. So some groups have looked into data segmentation. It's very simple in theory, but actually works quite well, where you take EEG time series and you, you shuffle it in time. So you create completely different EEG based on a very small data set, um, which is believable and within the same statistical parameters. And this can be used to, to train to train classifiers with a greater amount of data. And this has actually made the, made the classifiers more robust. So it's able to, to take some small data set and expand it using, using just um, some simple techniques. And you have more machine learning centered um, attempts uh, using general adverse, um, generative adverse serial networks to create completely synthetic EEG data based on a small sample. These tend to work um, well as well, but they suffer from the same problem that they need a big data set to create these uh, neural networks in the first place. But um, this is just an example of what people are looking at. So there are um, limitations to BCIs as I've already touched on. So this is just a, to go over that again. So there's, there's this low transfer rate. There's only so much information you can extract from the, from the brain um, at one point, and it's very constrained by the, um, the, the the, the paradigm that you're using and that kind of thing. It mostly needs to be set up by somebody who is skilled in doing so. It's usually not something that you can, can do if you're completely naive to, to EEG, although there are more commercial instruments coming becoming available, which are more intuitive using the dry electrodes, for example. They need to be constantly calibrated. You can't calibrate a BCI on day one and expect it to work in the same way as day two. There's going to be degradation in accuracy. And so that's that's a limitation of BCI. A lot of the um, electrodes are gel based, so it involves this kind of um, this extra hurdle to create this nice contact. You need to use this this gel in the hair, which can be annoying. Um, for some BCIs, you need this constant constant attention to to the to the um, to the paradigm, which can be very draining. Imagining motor imagery is not the easiest thing, especially if the BCI is performing poorly. Or if you're using an evoke potential for control, this can be um, this can be f fatiguing over time as well as you if you're exposed to these uh, stimuli. Um, BCI literacy is a is a is a real problem as well. There's there's about 10 percent, 10 to 15 percent of any population that are complete non-responders to BCI to EEG um, EEG based BCIs, for example. Um, no matter how much training a person does, they can't gain any control. It's just going to generate completely random, random feedback for the participants. So they 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 tend to not be able to um, benefit from BCIs at all. And then there's a small numbers of degrees of freedom. So the motor imagery BCI that I showed was uh, just a two class. So it could only make um, it could only distinguish between left and right hand BCI with high accuracy. The more um, the more classes you add to that, the worse the accuracy becomes. So you're really limited to a number, small degree, number of degrees of, of freedom. Um, uh, so, so really the take home message is that non-invasive BCIs take many different forms and it's, you can't really pin down exactly what a BCI with EEG, EEG is. It depends what the application that you're looking at is. Um, and they come with many different limitations which should be noted and they of course should be used responsibly. There's a lot of hype being generated about BCIs at the moment and about what they can and can't do. Um, but um, I think that the limitations are 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 very important and these should be taken into consideration before believing any of the hype that, that is surrounding brain computer interfaces in the media. So I'll take any questions because that's me at the end. Thank you.